All right, you guys, well, welcome today. I'm excited for my dad. You'll see on the screen here, labeled Gary Galanis, to share with you guys a little bit about uh, what's been happening in uh, Lubbock, Texas. And uh, yeah, really, mainly Lubbock, but it's, I, I, I feel like uh, his influence and in talking about what's happened in uh, his, some of the um, work he's been doing in the jail in Lubbock has bounced to some other places, people that have been influenced, some of you guys, by what he's been doing there. But I wanted him to just share kind of how he got into working in the jail, how he started the DMM process in the jail, started seeing some groups started, started seeing some things happen. And then I really wanted him to focus some on uh, generational growth because he's seen more of it in our network than most of us have seen that I'm aware of. And so he can speak to third, fourth, and even fifth gen discovery group multiplication, which I want to talk some about. And so if you have questions, again, definitely put those in the chat, but I want him to share for a minute. And I think you guys will be encouraged. So dad, would you kind of tell us the story of going out into the jail and uh, some of what you've seen there? And then we'll take some questions. You have to unmute, unmute first there. There you go. There you go. Let me start out by asking the question of how many of you like going to Walmart to go out among the lost? Okay, Jim, way to go, man. Not me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I was going out to Walmart and uh, talking to people and everything, and that's okay. But I, said, I started thinking, boy, is this very effective? And I know it can be. It's, you know, it's a lot of numbers and everything. But I started thinking about, you know, how I, how I could be more effective. So um, we actually had a, a jail ministry out at uh, Lubbock County Detention Center. And we'd been doing that for uh, several years and, you know, having a lot of converts and everything. And uh, then um, during that time, something happened and they closed down the services. We couldn't do the services anymore. So at the same time, we were, tell me if this is right, Chris, at the same time, we were starting to do DMM. So what we did when they closed down those services is we did what we called a DMM blitz out at the, out at the, LCDC at the Lubbock County Detention Center. And so we sent all the staff and other people who wanted to go. We went out there and blitzed every pod out of the jail and came up with all kinds of people that were interested in doing DGs. And so that's how I really got started going out uh, to the jail because uh, uh, we wanted to, we had the goal of having somebody in every pod, uh, you know, starting uh, DGs. And so, um, uh, I started going out to the jail four to five times a week. And what's so neat about that, I know it's, it's kind of impossible to do, but it's really neat to be able to schedule every day when you can go out among the lost, know there's people going to be there, and you're going to get to share the gospel every day. I mean, it's unbelievable. There's no telling how many hundreds of people I was able to share the DMM principles with, and the gospel also is it was a little bit different out at the out at the jail because when it, when guys you know we would announce that hey uh we're going to do bible study in in the in the pod they had little rooms you could go into and guys could come in there and so uh you know uh so we'd go in there and i'd invite people in and and they would come and i would be able to uh share uh you know start dbs's with them and, um, but what's so neat about it is every day when I went in there, I would have anywhere from five to 15 people in there. And usually it was, you know, a lot of times it was different people. So um, because of that, I thought if this was my only opportunity to share with somebody, I did want them to hear the good news about the gospel. Because we do live in the Bible Belt here in Lubbock, Texas. And most people are, you know, kind of, they have kind of a, a Christian cultural background. And so, um, and, and so I would always uh, uh, share the gospel with them. But anyhow, uh, one of the challenges in, in, uh, in the jail, and something I also found, find useful when we go out to the parks now, uh, the parks are a lot better than Walmart, by the way, too, <laughs> um, is uh, one of the things uh, I wanted to share with them was um, how they could start a discovery Bible study. In other words, we, I'd go into the pod, uh, we'd invite people in, and um, I would show them how to do a discovery Bible study, okay? And then after I was in there uh, a week or so, 
I would start calling on the men to start leading the DBS. What I found out over the, over the long run on that is it wasn't very effective because as long as I was meeting in there, uh, it still kind of centered around me. So when it became, uh, so what I started doing is looking for people of peace. And, I, and, and so instead of coming in there and meeting with the DBS group, I met with, uh, uh, I would find who I thought was a, a potential person of peace. And I would start meeting with them and uh, uh, in, uh, teaching them DMM principles so that they could go out into their pod and they could, uh, you know, that they could start DGs out there. Uh, when I first went in there, you know, it was a while, you know, I was doing these DBSs, I was sharing the gospel, I was being faithful to do that, but I really wasn't, uh, you know, uh, seeing the fruit yet I wanted to see. But, uh, but just persevering in that, one day uh, in one of the pods I was in, there was a guy I was working with in there, and he kept on telling me every week, yeah, I'll, I'll invite somebody to come in. And, you know, he just wasn't opening up his oikos. So I said, hey, you know, you're a great guy. Uh, but th this really didn't, this really didn't happen. And I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, do something else. So I just left him. I went out into the pod and just started cold calling out in the pod. And so there was a guy sitting at a, at a table and his name was Tress. And I went out and started talking to him and he ended up being the person of peace in that pod. And he brought uh, many more men with him uh, into a, into DBSs, and we were able to start a DG. But we eventually planted a church in there, uh, which is hard to do in the prison because they're moving these guys around all the time. But um, I had some generational growth in that in that pod. It started with Tress, and Tress introduced introduced it to Jake. Jake introduced it to uh, uh, Caesar. Caesar introduced it to Zabrian. Zabrian introduced it to a guy named Adam, and it's just started multiplying uh, like that. And, um, and uh, one of the interesting things is uh, when uh, I was in there before Chris actually started, before he took on a pod. And what was really exciting and encouraging to me is the first time Chris and Tyler went out there and started in a pod. And it was, uh, it was one of the, uh, it was a high security pod they were going into. So they were, uh, uh, they were being a little bit more brave too, I guess. But uh, as, I mentioned just now kind of the lineage of what was going on. And the last guy I mentioned was Adam. And Adam really wasn't on fire like the other guys and anything, but he was a guy that they brought in. So anyhow, first day, Chris and Tyler go into their pod when they go out uh, to the, uh, the jail, is they go in there and Adam had been moved from the pod I was uh, training in to that pod Chris was going in. And when Chris and Tyler went in there, Adam, tell me how to, how to say this, Chris, Adam had started a, a DG in there. Chris, do you wanna? Yeah, the day, the day that we went in, Adam was meeting with a group of people around a table. And so when we had him come into the classroom, he mentioned that he knew my dad and that he was leading the thing my dad had taught him to lead in the pod when we arrived that day to start um, a class and access ministry in that pod. So to, so I want to show you guys this graphic that kind of visually describes what my dad is sharing. Look at this. Can y'all see that? So this is what he made for me one day as we were trying to track what was going on in there. And again, I haven't seen many people be able to produce something like this yet. So seeing this was really exciting about some of the generational growth he was having. But these circles, you guys, for him, were not representing just people. This guy led this guy to the Lord. These each are representing groups. These are the leaders of groups. So as you could tell, he would go in into each of these pods. There was a group that was kind of a pod group. And then from that pod group, Tress was in that group and Tress started a group. And then Tress, you know, found Jay and Z and Z started a group, found Jake, Jake started a group. And check this out, you guys, the, the, the group that we walked into that day in 5C was, this is really, for, this is Gen Zero, my dad. One, two, three, four, this guy. This guy was leading a fourth generation discovery group in 5C that day that we walked in. So I think this diagram, Dad, can kind of help us see the, the general generational growth you were seeing with discovery groups. Dad, talk a little bit about how, how did you cast vision to trust to start the groups with Z and, or to teach Z and Jake how to start groups or Jake to teach Adam and David and, and Caesar? How did these guys know to be not just 
bringing people into their group, but starting new groups such that you got to a stream of fourth and even fifth generation over here? Yeah, I kind of ch changed the trend. In, D in DMM, it trains you to, uh, you know, after you do your Shema action, your Shema uh, action, your Shema statement, then you go into your transition, right? Your transition question, because you want to you want to see if they're interested in learning more about God. And the way I kind of switched that up some was, you know, there's really not that many people that are interested necessarily in doing a Bible study. So I started asking the men in there if they wanted to be, if they would like to be the spiritual leader of their family. I never had a man say that they did not want to be the spiritual leader of their family. And once they said that, I said, well, I can train you how to be the spiritual leader of your family. And uh, Chris came up with an acronym that we used called HOSS, H-O-S-S. -S. I changed it up a little bit different than him, but because again, it was in the prison and I didn't know if I'd always see him again. The first thing we did was H, we told him how to go to heaven. And I did a kind of a Roman road, not exactly. I used, uh, changed some of the verses that were more appropriate, I thought, for me in, in doing it. And uh, so uh, I would show them how to go to heaven or not show them how to go. I would help them discover how they could have eternal life. That was one of the most important things I did in there. I emphasized after every verse we did. Now, I would say, now, you understand that I'm not teaching you this. You just discovered this for yourself. Like I would do Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They would read that. And I, I would say, what does that teach you? Then we'd write it on the board, okay? I'd write it on the board, what they said. And then when we got through with all those verses, I would say, now, did I teach you this or did you discover this for yourself? And that they would say, I discovered this for myself. And so it gave them confidence. And they would start sharing this uh, with, uh, with other uh, guys in, in, the, in the pod. Because one of the things I try to use as kind of a, what do you say? Uh, it's an access. I, I, I use, in the prison, I use the gospel kind of as, as the access point. Because most people with a, with a Christian cultural background think that you're saved by works. So by sharing the gospel with them and telling them that it's by grace through faith and it's not by works, I, I know that's how I became saved in 1971. I thought you were saved by being a good person. And it just really spurred my interest that that wasn't true. And so I, I, I've never had it fail to, uh, to interest people that all of a sudden they say uh, salvation is a free gift just by putting your faith in Christ. So uh, that, that was kind of a, to me, a way to really stimulate them to want to, because I, I'd ask them, uh, you know, if, if knowing, having a relationship with God is the most important thing in life, and knowing that you're going to spend forever with him, that you're going to have eternal life. Isn't that somebody, if you're going to be the spiritual leader of your family, that you should be able to share with them, to articulate to them? Shouldn't you be able to? And every one of them would say, yes, I need to be able to do that. So they would write down these verses, and they would, uh, and they would, be, they would get on the phone with their families, and they would start sharing this with their families. Um, so, uh, yeah. And, but... The, one of the things I, but how I transitioned into uh, kind of discipleship, the last verse I always used in, in my gospel presentation was Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. So then I would ask, so then I would ask the guys, okay, so now if you trusted in Jesus as your Savior, you have eternal life. Does that mean you can go on sinning? And they would say, no, no, I, I don't. And then I'd say, well, why not? And they would come up with all these reasons. So then I would take them in uh, to uh, add on to the Ephesians 2, 8, 9, uh, verse 10. Uh, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. And that's how I set them up for the second letter. Hoss, tell them how to go to heaven. The O is obey. And so that's how I transition, because I really want to make sure that they don't start thinking salvation is by works again. You know what I'm saying? So I, I hooked on the verse 10 to the Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 in order to get them to thinking about what are these works 
God has prepared in advance for me to do from all eternity. And I found that to be very effective. At the last, before we got kicked out because of COVID, um, I got to where uh, I was, the, the man I was, I was training uh, to be spiritual leaders, um, I, I, I would have them sharing the gospel and leading a DBS by the third time we met. The, the first time I shared the gospel with them and then they shared it with others that week. The next week I showed them how to do a DBS and then they were leading it after that and they were training men out in the pod how to do that. Uh, I told you about the, the pod where we started the church, but really the most, um, you know, people, you know, ask about people of peace and all, and all that, you know, <laughs> you know a people, you know a person of peace the minute you see them. Because a lot of times, well, that gosh, they're receptive, they're nice and everything. Man, you know a person of peace. There was a guy named Billy in the, in the, in the jail. The guy looks like a Greek god. I mean, he's tall, just handsome, uh, you know, and, um, but anyhow, he caught on fire. I shared with him, and he's a leader type. And uh, he started, uh, he immediately uh, started taking the reins from me, and he started taking it out of the pods. And he was moved from pod to pod. And he was, as he was moved from pod to pod, he was taking these principles with him. And um, Chris, why don't you tell him about Billy in lesson four in DMM? Yeah, so my dad introduced us to Billy because uh, he had a number of guys, about 15 guys that through the discovery process had come to faith in Christ and he wanted to begin to train them to go out and make disciples and plant churches. And so we brought them all out from their various pods into this large classroom. And that's kind of how we got to know Billy. My dad had kept, he kept telling me about this guy named Billy that's just really reproducing this. And so you guys were going through lesson one of the training, lesson two, these guys are eating it up. Talk about obedience-based disciple making training. I mean, these guys were doing what the lessons said. They were gathering together to pray and they were just definitely on fire and, and sharing with everybody. Well, anyways, you guys remember lesson four, right? Lesson four is a lesson on vision and you're supposed to create envision statements. Y'all remember this from the training and your envision statement. If this is a catalytic training, you know, it might be for a whole region or whatever. If it's just for, you know, um, uh, people that maybe aren't as uh, catalytic, just kind of or ordinary folks could be for a neighborhood or for their family or something like that, right? Trying to reach everybody in some kind of a, a group of people. Well, anyways, Billy had a vision for that jail. And so he came back the next week. We got kicked out because of COVID like in week five, I think. But he uh, sent to us his envision statement. I think I've, I've read it um, uh, where some of you guys have heard it, but I'll read it again just because to me it shows the power of what uh, my dad was doing with those guys and they're really raising them up to be the disciple makers and church planners. But Billy, after lesson four, creating his envision statement, we had him go around and think about everybody in their family, friends, coworkers, neighbors, how many churches would need to be planted to reach them, and you know who was going to do it if you didn't. And they're like, nobody, we've got to do it. And so Billy writes this. He said, our vision is for pod 6B to have an indigenous church plant. This is a guy in jail. <laughs> just learning about this, just gone through this training. Uh, our vision is for 6B to have an indigenous church planting movement that is led by a group of believers, thus allowing all in 6B to hear the gospel and have a chance to receive Christ. We will be starting with, listen to this, we will, we're going to start with the nine churches we've already planted in the past few weeks. And our end vision is to have all the males in the Lubbock County Detention Center have the opportunity to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior by remote housing changes, meaning they were going to be willing to move from their good pods to the bad pods to reach people in pods that didn't have a worker. So they're going to reach the whole jail by remote housing changes and DMM training so that DBSs will be going on every pod. Furthermore, he wanted us to know, he, he wants to emphasize that their goal for these church planners is to carry this movement on wherever their destination may be, whether that's prison or outside of the jail. You guys. <laughs> And so these are the kind of guys that were coming back to this training that we were dealing with that were just so excited. And he, he had started so many groups and he was probably one of the most effective disciple makers out there. But um, I, I believe, Dad, you found him just by going into one of the pods. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anything else, Dad, that was on your mind to share with the group from the jail? 
I don't, I don't think so. You guys, what I wanted you to hear and see is just the types of disciples that were being produced there. And then also that, that chart so that you could see true generational growth among lost people. Again, not all these were churches. This is, we talk about four and five streams of groups starting among lost people. They started a generation one, uh, at least one, maybe, maybe more, maybe 10, if you include Billy's uh, generation one uh, churches out there. But, uh, but most of the higher generational growth was among the discovery groups. So, and, and one thing that my dad would tell me, he would tell the guys a lot, and this is from um, the lesson eight diagram, if you remember from the training, is the way we're supposed to coach people that we're leading, uh, persons of peace or the leaders of these groups, uh, when we get together with them is in four ways. If you look at that DMM cycle, let me just pull it up because this is important. Uh, let's see. Okay, so lesson eight, if you guys remember the DMM cycle, it looks like this. Let me share this screen with you here. Can you guys see this? Okay, the DMM cycle. Do y'all see this? Dad, can you give me a thumbs up if you see it? Do you see the DMM cycle? Okay, y'all see, okay. So as you're finding your person of peace and you're looking to make disciples through discovery groups, look at this, look at how you're supposed to be training those that are doing it in four things. Read, are they reading? Are they obeying? Are they sharing? And are they starting new groups? Read, obey, share, and start new groups. This is what, when you're looking for, this is where a lot of us are. What do we need to be doing with the DGs that we've started? We need to train, coach, the pop, and others to facilitate the group. They're not teaching. And what do they need to do? They need to read, obey, and share, and start new groups. What do they need to do? They need to read the passage. They're going to talk about it. They're going to obey. They're going to share with others. And when they find people that are receptive, they're going to start new groups with them. So I think the reason, you know, uh, that's important is because I remember my dad telling me he was telling these guys that all the time. So he was telling them, hey, you need to be starting groups. You need to be starting groups. Groups don't usually just happen organically. Somebody is encouraging them to be started. They're encouraging people to share. They're encouraging somebody to start new groups. So dad was doing a great job, I thought, at encouraging these guys, read, obey, share, and start new groups. And I think that's one of the reasons they saw a lot of groups started out there generationally, not just at generation one. One thing, one thing I would add, uh, the spiritual leader type introduction. Uh, I'm finding that to be very effective out in the parks also. I mean, everybody wants to be the spiritual leader of their family. And mm -hmm. I do it with women and men. I don't, just a, just a thought, but uh, it's, it's a lot more uh, kind of uh, challenging and convicting than just asking somebody if they wanna do a Bible study or even learn more about God. Well, you know, they may not want to learn more about God, but they may want to be the spiritual leader of their family. I don't know. I've just found it to be really effective and I'm finding the same thing out at the park. We actually uh, met a person down fishing by the lake and this was during COVID and uh, uh, me and uh, another one of a, another guy in our church were able to meet with him several times at his apartment complex, just walking up to him cold. And uh, he was actually having uh, marital problems at the time. And um, he knew he needed to be the spiritual leader of his family. And uh, that attracted him to want to, you know, meet with us. So mm -hmm. that's just, that's just something I've found that it just really seems effective to me. That's great. Dad, thanks for sharing. You guys, we have a few minutes left. I'd love for y'all to ask him some questions. So you may have some questions about general growth, he's, uh, generational growth he's seen or about jail ministry or just anything about what he was uh, saying there. Faye's got a couple, Dad, if you can look in the chat there. Um, she's asking one, do you have direct contact um, in coaching the, the Adams or do you uh, now coach others in the generation above him to coach him? So were you dad when he was at fourth generation interacting with him directly or was somebody else interacting with Adam? No, that's what's exciting. No, I, I didn't even really know Adam. I knew him because they talked about him. I had met him in the pod, but I never, never had a one-on-one, -on -one, never talked to him. Yeah. And that's the same. And that's the same with all Billy's guys too. I just met with Billy and, and Billy was the, he was the, 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 the main guy. I mean, he was, he was, he was the insider. I was the outsider. Billy was the insider. And Faye, I would say typically kind of as a best practice in a sense, my dad was there and he was accessible to an Adam through a Caesar or something if they needed him, because 
you know, the unbeliever that was above him that helped him start a group wouldn't be able to help him with some things, right? And so usually we think of the coach or the church planner as being available even for second gen and third gen and so on until there are believers that are developed there. But in terms of just group starting and managing that process, it can tend to multiply quickly even without you knowing. You just, my dad would tend to find out like he did on the sheet. That's why he had Adam circled who they are and how to be accessible to especially the groups that are really thriving because if they continue to multiply, they might need his help. So yeah, the second question she asked is, um, do you have that verse plan that you use under the H and Haas that you could share with the group? Well, it's just a particular one that I, I just used uh, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, but then I was changed it. I went to John 3.16 and then to Ephesians 2.8 and 9 and then added on verse 10 to get them to start thinking about obeying immediately, immediately thinking about being a disciple. Great. Um, uh, Faye on Haas, so it's uh, heaven, uh, you know, you can't be a good spiritual leader if you don't know how to get to heaven, you can't share it with others. You can't be a good spiritual leader without you obeying God, setting an example for others and teaching others to hear and obey God. And then SS is start new groups. So S is the start in the plural of groups. So we're looking for a Haas because H-O-S, if they try to say that, it sounds not like a good word. So we definitely want two S's on there. So it's clearly Haas and not something else. So that's where Chris, it goes from. Chris, I, I used it more like you used R-O-S-S, read, uh, obey, share, start new groups. That's the way I used Haas. And I used heaven, obey, share, start new groups. That's the way I used it. Dad, John's asking, how has COVID affected your work at the jail? I haven't been able to go in. Yeah, we were right in the middle of the training, John, in like lesson four after we got this envision statement and we all got kicked out. You couldn't even go visit them. I've written a letter to Billy. I know dad is looking to go to their, they are offering a training now at LCDC to come back in, but it's just been a lot of silence. My thought, John, this is what I just, this is why I wrote a letter to him and I can't wait for him to go back in. My thought is since we weren't just doing a service where they came to hear my dad preach, right? My thought is when he goes back in, Billy's continue to start groups and, he, and Billy's going to have a, a, a lot more than nine churches to tell us about. That would be my guess, but uh, I guess I'll have to update you on that. I'll just tell you going, if you can, if you can do, if you can go into the jail, it's like fishing in a barrel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's um uh... One of the main things that prevents people from coming to know the Lord is the distractions of life. And in prison, all they have to do is contemplate about, you know, what's going on in their life, what they want to, what they want to see accomplished in their life. I mean, it's kind of like going to, kind of like walk to Emmaus or vacation Bible school or whatever, getting people away from the normal distractions of everyday life to where they can, where they actually think and meditate and listen uh, to God. Yeah. Dad, Jim has a question for you there in the chat. Do you see that? He I'm, asked. I'm afraid, I'm afraid of Jim's question. <laughs> <laughs> Jim asks, when you meet someone in the park that wants to be the spiritual leader of their family, if they want to learn to do a DBS with their immediate family, but nothing beyond that, would you still consider them a pop? with their family well that's where we want them to start out right is with their with their families and then hopefully as they obey uh the word of god um hopefully their attitude would change but initially i mean that's our dream for them to just start with their family wouldn't it be um, you know yeah jim i think you know if they're willing to open the oikos of their family even if they say hey i'm not sure about my friends i think their willingness even to open that small oikos is worth continuing to pursue and then maybe as they begin to you know do the discovery bible studies together through these key passages as they share it'll start to open up friends and co-workers and neighbors yeah. okay you guys anything else before we okay matt's got one dad um, when someone says yes to dbs are you taking them through the eight-week training or teaching them how to lead the dbs So when one of the guys in the jail says, yes, they would like to do a DG, do you take them through the eight-week training first? Well, uh, okay. Now, what's the eight-week training? The DMM training. Oh, the DMM training. No, the, okay. I had two different things I was doing. I was meeting in the pods, and I was meeting with the people of peace in that pod. 
okay? And then when I found the peace, pull of peace in that pod, what they allowed us to do on a Thursday is pull these guys from all the different pods. And I was able to do DMM training with the people of peace. But what was happening in the pods was that uh, originally I was leading the DBSs in the pods. And then that evolved into uh, me uh, just meeting with a person of peace in that pod and then letting them uh, start the DBSs in the pods. So it kind of evolved from me doing it to, um, to uh, them doing it. And I, I tried not to be the center of attention uh, when I came into the pods. Does that answer the question though? I'm not sure. And that's, uh, I think they're nodding, so. Uh, Louis, I just sent you 10 stories of hope. Dad would often use that. Uh, and then Matt, last question, and we'll break into our groups. Matt's asking Dad about how many guys, are you asking Matt total how many in the jail or how many he impacted through the discovery groups? Which, which one? Just how many guys total in the whole jail? Dad, about 1,100, right? 1,200? Uh, we had, it could, the capacity was 1,700, but usually we had 12, 1,300 uh, men and women in there. Obviously, women. obviously mostly men, but mm -hmm. uh, it was men and, and women. But uh, it was a pretty big, pretty big population. Over, over the two years I was in there, I, I mean, I, I shared with hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. You guys, last thing I'll say, and then we'll, we'll break into our groups, is I tell folks this all the time in training, unless the Lord has specifically told you to start somewhere else, I encourage people for the sake of their city to consider starting in the jail. And not so much as a jail ministry, like we're going to start in the jail because we want to reach people in the jail. That, there's nothing wrong with that. But you guys, we began to see the jail as access to the tough neighborhoods of our city that we were trying to reach. So if we had a specific neighborhood in our city that was very pipsy and was high crime and it was a neighborhood we felt God sending us to, we looked to the jail to be the place that might help us find persons of peace that would then when they get out, come back into that area and open the neighborhood to us. So we see that we saw the jail as almost itself an access ministry for the neighborhoods of our city. And you guys, you know, we could initially we might have thought that this was isolated to our city, but we've had people tell us over and over again that they found the jail to be a very fruitful place of making disciples in their area. So.